So, uh, thank you, um, organizers, for uh, inviting me. Um, thank you, um, Gianluca, for the kind introduction and the kind words. Um, I'm really happy to be here. Um, it's, it's a great network. It's great that we have this uh, cycle of every two years seeing each other with all these people working on advisory systems, working on education. Uh, obviously, the other years we always have IFSA. Uh, there we also see some of the same faces. And it's, uh, it's good to see that we keep uh, this tradition alive. So, um, as Gianluca uh, said, I will connect to some of these topics, which are also quite central in the theme of the conference. And I will uh, connect uh, the work on especially extension. I apologize that maybe the education component is a little bit less. Uh, I will uh, connect it to what's happening in extension and also where we should go as a community of researchers. Uh, I will focus my keynote speech very much on the research aspect. At the end of the seminar, we have Kristen Davis, uh, who you might know as the former uh, director of GFRAS, and she will probably connect more to the policy and practice elements. So then we have a nice division uh, of tasks and a nice division of attention. So, to start with, uh, a little anecdote. So uh, you can look at the screen and maybe you can raise your hands if you uh, recognize or you know the man who is in the picture. Yes, I don't, don't see that many hands. Yes, yeah, really good, yeah. Uh, some people who have been around for a while know who this is. Um, <laughs> yes, very good. This is uh, now Emeritus uh, Professor uh, Volker Hoffmann and uh, he uh, used to be Professor of Extension uh, at Hohenheim University. Uh, now, uh, I think his role has been uh, taken over by Andrea Knierim, eh, who's working on these topics. And uh, as you can see, there's a really nice train station here, beautiful Italian train. Um, Assisi, very nice town of Assisi. You see the 19th ESEE, eh, so that's about, I think, 10 years ago. Eh, we're now back in Italy, really nice. So the anecdote is that uh, I was a recent PhD graduate you know, really filled with fire and passion, enthusiasm, you know, I'm going to do advisory services extension. So I was going to this conference, you know, flying to Rome, uh, seeing some of the different ESD friends there. I think Ilke was also there. I think he was sharing the train. Uh, Michael was in the same train as well. And I think also Volker was there. At least that's what my memory reconstructs. As you know, memories reconstruct and they cannot be always very accurate. Uh, so maybe it was also at another moment, but I think it was in the train. So Volker, he was like sitting there, very pessimistic, you know, destroying my youthful enthusiasm, saying, yeah, yeah, extension is dead, you know, it's going down the drain. You know, Hohenheim, it's not going to continue extension science. Uh, Reading, uh, Chris Garford, he's going on retirement, it won't be continued. Uh, yeah, maybe this will be the last ESEE, very pessimistic. So yeah, luckily, you know, Assisi is a very uh, spiritual, spiritual, holy town, uh, Francis of Assisi. So luckily there we got the holy spirit of extension back. And uh, I can say uh, that now we are here, there's good news to bring. Uh, research on and attention to extension seems alive and kicking. Uh, I, I hope you agree with me. Um, maybe you have the same pessimism, but I don't share it. Uh, I think in the last 10 years, we really have seen a revival in terms of uh, this topic being, you know, uh, much more central in policy making. Uh, also, uh, lots of interesting studies appearing on it. So I put here some, some different networks. So obviously, I think we had GFRAS, uh, very important, the Global Forum on Rural Advisory Services, really being a catalyst uh, for getting this back onto the agenda, also for getting uh, more funding attention to it, uh, getting also knowledge sharing going. And then we also saw a lot of different regional networks forming. We have RELACER, uh, the Latin American uh, network for rural extension. Uh, we have, well, that one has existed already for a long time, the APEN network in uh, Australia, New Zealand. But also we have the African Forum for Agriculture Advisory Services. Uh, uh, also uh, the Asian uh, network. So a lot of networks forming, talking about this topic, thinking about this topic. 
Uh, but also we see initiatives, a lot of EU projects having this topic. So uh, now I know there are several people, for example, from AgriDemo here, working on kind of demo farms, demo farms 2.0, 3.0, 4.0, uh, whatever generation they're in. Uh, the AgriLink project working on you know, new ways of looking at agricultural knowledge and innovation systems. But also, for example, in Africa, the Agriculture for Impact Initiative. Um, well, Europe, obviously, here yeah, we have UFRAS. But also a new project, Fair Share, connecting to the digital revolution, digital tools for advisors. So I think we can conclude there's a lot going on. Yeah? And even in the north, in the Nordic countries, in Sweden, this has been put on the agenda. Magnus, pay attention. Yeah? Yes, very good. Uh, thanks to Magnus, fighting for five years or even more, he also got a center on rat giving, uh, on extension. So that's really nice to see. So before I go further into my talk, I want to say something about the term extension. Uh, we are still calling this uh, conference, European Seminar on Extension and Education. But obviously, all of us, I think we know that extension and the term, it has been tremendously broadened. And extension, as we used to know it, public service, bringing knowledge to the farmers, uh, like the, the middle picture, extension bridges the gap uh, to make sure that the, the farmer doesn't use horses anymore but buys a tractor. Yeah, uh, that is virtually non-existent. Uh, um, the name is still there. I think it's still an interesting kind of container name for everything what's underneath it. Uh, but, but we've come to see it as a very broad range of all kinds of services, advisory services. Uh, so still, you know, advising on technical topic, uh, advising on farm management topics. It can also still be quite linear. Huh? Linear is not necessarily bad. Uh, huh? When you have a clear message to bring and there's a clear need for it, you know, just go and bring the message. But obviously, we have also come to see extension as a, as a broad package of facilitation roles, facilitating multi-stakeholder networks, facilitating farmer field schools, uh, but also intermediation, uh, connecting farmers to markets, uh, connecting farmers uh, to all kinds of supply chain actors if they want to do uh, the more uh, radical innovations. It's needed also to create those networks. So really we see extension now as a very broad range of what you could call innovation support services, uh, which can go uh, from everyday innovation, small tweaks and twitches to the farming system to really big transformation in, in farming systems and supply chains. We've also come to see extension as, a, as something which is not just provided by public actors. Uh, in, in some countries there are still public actors. Uh, uh, I think in some European countries, like Germany, uh, in different states, there's still public actors. Uh, also, you have Chambre d'Agriculture, which you could call kind of a public actor. Uh, but it's also provided by private actors. In some countries, it's only private. In some countries, it's a mix. And increasingly, also, cooperatives uh, are providing these kinds of roles. Uh, and also, in addition, NGO actors. Uh, especially in the context of Africa, there are many NGOs uh, providing advisory services. So um, advisory services, it's also important to note that they're provided both as a core business. So you have people really dedicated to this. Uh, it's their, their, their whole life, it's their whole profession, uh, providing independent advice to farmers. But others also do it as a side activity. Uh, they also sell inputs, for example, and they provide advice on that. And obviously, uh, that, that has pros and cons, different forms. But it's important to realize there's great diversity in that. And also what is important to note that uh, extension in the broader sense is focused on agriculture, but also it's focused on rural development, but also increasingly on communities uh, in kind of rural urban fringes, or even extension is purely urban. If you look at the US systems, uh, at least the stories I hear, mainly what they do is community service, and they've kind of moved out of the rural and agricultural uh, sectors because that's where every business now fulfills those tasks and they need to justify their funding so they have shifted to urban areas. And so it's really important to see extension in a really broad way. And uh, this is also captured in different books. Uh, uh, we have the old uh, books by Anne van den Ban, uh, Agricultural Extension, and there's still lots of good stuff in it. But Kees Lewis has already broadened it to communication for rural innovation. But also uh, in some countries they still 
have still a more traditional understanding of extension. And so there's also great diversity across the globe on how we understand this. So some of the consolidated streams of work in recent years, and, and there might be other streams, that this is also my assessment, and hopefully in the discussion you come also with great ideas and great suggestions on, how, uh, on what else is there and what else we can do for the future. So if I look a little bit at the literature, um, and some people who work with me, they know that I'm sometimes kind of a walking library. Uh, I have, for some reason, the capacity to remember references. So if I, if I look at my own personal library in my uh, mental uh, map, I, I see a lot of work recently uh, to ACUS development. Uh, ACUS, obviously, agricultural knowledge and information system, as it used to be called in the 90s. Uh, that was work by Niels Reuling, Paul Engel. It was quite popular then. And then it faded away a bit, but it became reinvented, also due to the SCAR working group. And then one eye uh, shifted from information to innovation systems. And now there's lots of studies uh, looking at ACIS in different countries, doing comparative studies, looking, you know, what are the different governance mechanisms, uh, which are the audiences, what are the gaps. Uh, so there's, for example, this, this nice paper of Andrea Knierim uh, on pluralism of advisory service providers. Uh, but there's also other work on ACIS uh, comparison. There's a whole um, documentation uh, of a wide range of these new intermediary roles. Uh, I think Alex has written uh, uh, an overview article. But also, for example, colleagues at, at Newcastle University recently published this paper on expertise in rural development, uh, also looking a little bit you know, on how can we look at this with a fresh view. Well, there's a continuous attention to development of methodologies, eh, advisory methodologies, advisory tools, pedagogy. Eh, uh, how do you facilitate the learning processes? What are different ways of learning, engaging with farmers, peer-to-peer -peer learning? What is the role of advisors in that? All those kinds of topics. I looked at the program, and there are several papers, again, on this at this conference. But also, eh, there are sometimes critical studies on the role of advisory services within policy and practice. Uh, um, especially in contexts which are maybe not uh, that kind of uh, adhered to the way we see democracy in the Western world, uh, with the recognition that there's diversity in the world and Western democracy might not fit everywhere. Uh, uh, for example, there are really nice critical studies on how extension in Ethiopia is still very much used purely as a political tool uh, for influencing farmers, for basically getting votes, uh, uh, as far as you need votes in Ethiopia. Uh, so <laughs> there's, there's still critical work on that, and, and also critical work uh, in Latin America on those types of topics. Uh, what is the, the power involved with extension? And that obviously is not a new topic. It has been there uh, for, for various decades already. But it, each time it needs attention also because uh, the context change. And then, obviously, there's behavior change and adoption. Um, I think, you know, behavior models, to you plant behavior. Uh, uh, what else do we have, to have there? Well, we have several. I can't even name them all. Uh, they, they still continue to be interesting. They can also be really useful, for example, to look at adoption of public goods, uh, environmental programs. Uh, uh, they're very useful, but I would say, you know, there also needs to be a balance between more the individualistic views, uh, looking at the person, what happens in the head, and what happens in the system around the person and the interaction. Uh, but these streams, they are there, they continue to be there, and they continue to have value. But does this mean we can sit back and relax? Uh, it's a great place to sit back and relax. Uh, the organizers kindly put me in a resort. I could also have decided to, you know, buy some swimming, swimming trunks in the shop and sit on a, on a deck chair, but, you know, had to do my duties. I would see, no, eh, there's work to be done. Eh, we, we are still not finished. And I think we also need to use this opportunity of that, there's, that there's new energy in this extension movement eh, to, to, to really push the agenda and put new topics on the agenda. Um, eh, we, we need to both assess critically current paradigms. Uh, for example, the, the multi-actor approach. Uh, we, as scientists, we need to scrutinize it. We also need to question the assumptions. Uh, um, at many of these conferences, 
uh, people like Inge van Oost talk about the European Innovation Partnership. And I think it has many good sides, uh, but also we need to look at, you know, are there dark sides of the EIP? Uh, and, and what does that mean for policy making? But also, does that mean for, you know, uh, you know the, the, the power of, of policy makers in, in pushing where the field should go? And is that really where the field wants to go, both the field of extension science, but also the practical field? Uh, we need to ask those types of questions. Uh, coincident coincidentally, I got a review request from Science and Public Policy today to review a paper precisely on the influence uh, agenda setters within these big European programs exercise on, you know, what is, you know, interesting and what is not interesting. So I think that is really a good question for the future. Well, we need to keep abreast of fast-changing agri-food environments. I will talk a little bit about that. Uh, uh, farming, agriculture, rural areas, uh, they're, they're, they're changing really rapidly. There are lots of forces going on. But also, we need to engage with new theoretical orientation and methodologies to renew, refresh the field. Uh, extension has a long kind of multidisciplinary tradition, and we easily engage with different theories. I think we could, should continue to do so. So what follows are some ideas and suggestions. Uh, so this is not like the agenda cast in stone. Uh, uh, Lawrence Clerks from Wageningen orders, and we need to execute. No, it's just some ideas to get the discussion going. And maybe some of this work is already being done. Maybe you say, oh, gee, it has been done ages ago. Don't even go into that territory. Uh, the more senior members of this community can, 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 can give some criticism on that. So what are some of these major challenges, developments, and trends that are influencing agriculture? Well, obviously, we are faced with a growing demand for food, fiber, and energy. Uh, it's basically because we, as humankind, we reproduce like rabbits, still, and uh, we're growing to nine billion or 10 billion even, and those people need to eat, because if you don't feed them, you will get problems, wars, you know, for example. There's also people saying, shouldn't we, instead of increasing the food supply, reduce the reproduction rate, but that is mostly a taboo issue in some countries. So we, we need to take into account, we need to cope with this. Also, we need to cope, obviously, with climate change. Uh, in many countries, normal agricultural patterns are severely disturbed. Uh, this also has to do with, you know, how can you build resilient systems? Uh, obviously, you can also always go for technical fixes, but they will have their own negative consequences. You can say, oh, it becomes drier, let's irrigate more. Okay, what will you do in 10 years when your aquifers are depleted? Uh, so that requires quite some rethinking. Uh, also, we need to cope with resource degradation. Uh, all those you know, areas brought into agricultural production. You know, how can you keep healthy soils, healthy ecosystems? Uh, we in the Netherlands, uh, we are a very good slash bad example of intensification. Our agricultural lands are very monotonous. We don't have a lot of wildflowers, so insect populations are dropping, butterfly populations are dropping. And uh, so it's also about agricultural biodiversity, and uh, we need to take care of that. We also need to deal with a growing middle class uh, that obviously has, for example, implications for uh, protein consumption. Uh, should they all eat meat or should they eat different proteins, uh, maybe insect or something? Uh, it also uh, is about critical consumers. Uh, uh, we, s we have seen this happening in Europe, that people are demanding better animal welfare, better environmental issues. But you also see it in other places. In New Zealand, there's now a huge debate going on about the social license to produce. And basically, they are seeing the same phenomenon, nutrient leaching to the waters, we've seen in Europe already 20 years ago in the more intensive areas. Also in Latin America, where you have a growing urban middle class in cities like Buenos Aires, Santiago, Montevideo, they are critical about their food. And they want you know, good conditions. And yeah, farmers need to take that into account, that it also, you know, is a new area of learning. We have aging rural population and decline in some places, uh, like Spanish villages emptying. Uh, but in other places in the world, rural populations are still growing. In Africa, uh, what should we do? Let those people migrate to the cities or uh, let them stay in the countryside, also to avoid problems in cities? How then we uh, can create jobs in rural areas uh, big questions, and obviously farm succession. Uh, there's not a single country where I've been uh, where the average age of the farmer is below 55 or something. That's everywhere. Developing countries, emerging countries, you know, European countries, so that's really an issue. 
And how do we create the farmer of the future? Who is that farmer? Uh, or is that kind of buyer incorporated? Is that the farmer of the future? With just a bunch of employees doing the farming. And so that also connects to the next point, uh, the corpor corporatization of agriculture uh, versus smallholder. What is the model? Uh, the FAO, they support smallholders. I would say, no, it needs to be scale increase. But also specialization versus multifunctionality. How do we deal with that? I think in Europe we have quite now a balanced debate about that, but in some other countries this is still coming up. And then also uh, we have to move beyond agriculture. Uh, we need to shift towards uh, a food systems approach. It's about food production, consumption, waste, recycling. Um, and it also comes with new technologies, vertical, circular, regenerative, digital, synthetic farming, food production. And so we have a lot of you know, challenges, issues, and trends coming up, which will affect agriculture and how we do extension. So this leads to my first, you know, terms, uh, which I put in my title, transformation and disruption. So transition and transformation have become key pillars of policy agendas worldwide. And if they're not yet on the policy agenda, they're definitely on the science agenda. So we people working on innovation, transformation, and we have really also started to realize transformation is, is part of how we should you know, approach innovation because we need to tackle all those challenges. And uh, this is also reflected in a very nice article by Johan Schott and Edward Steinmüller. And they also talk about innovation policy should also shift. And so we should shift from thinking about innovation as R&D, which is then eventually also brought to end users, and it's also the classical definition of extension. Then we started to think about systems of innovation, uh, think about ACIS, multi-actor approach. Uh, we need to work together, uh, but still uh, some of the goals are mainly economic, uh, or economic with uh, the three Ps, uh, people, profit, and planet. And they say we need to go to a paradigm of transformative innovation policy or mission-oriented innovation policy. So basically their statement is we need to become much more clear where do we want to go? What is our sustainable future? Yeah. What does that imply? Yeah. Should, we, should we continue uh, to basically say, no, yeah, protein, let's increase meat production in a sustainable way, or should we say, no, we're going to shift it. We're going to eat synthetic protein, we're going to eat insects. Yeah. So that's much more direction, giving direction. And that obviously also has implications for extension. And there's also different drivers of this change. Uh, we already discussed there are natural drivers, economic drivers, technological drivers, all those new possibilities coming up. And some of, the, some of these can really be potentially quite disruptive. And they can be disruptive for the way we produce foods and fibers and energy. Uh, but they can also be disruptive for the way we do advisory work to support those systems. And um, many of you uh, probably have seen this model already, the multi-level perspective. And the multi-level perspective basically sees transition and transformation from three levels. So you have the current systems, uh, what they call the regimes, kind of locked-in systems. Uh, you could say factory farming is a locked-in system. Then you have initiatives, uh, which try to come in with, with new ideas, which try to shift that. Um, for example, agroecology, you could see it as a niche. They want to shift the current factory farming system. And then you have landscape development, climate change, or other uh, uh, technological developments. They foster, can help these types of transformations to occur. And so, so the, these, these ph phenomena of transformation, disruption, they can affect both the agricultural regime, and the way we produce, consume food, but also they can affect the advisory regimes. Uh, the way we commonly view extension, do extension. And so that's why it's important also to reflect on this and ask questions about what does the transformation agenda imply for extension. Well, connected to this idea of, of transformation and disruption is also that, that this transformation and disruption is, is not having one direction only. Uh, clearly, it, it has a, a transformation, a sustainability direction, uh, but, but there can be different flavors in it, different ways. So transformation and disruption are by no means value-free. Uh, and they have uh, different paradigms, different values, different visions. Uh, there's different ways that we can do the agriculture of the future. 
And so we can say, yeah, we we're going to do much more multifunctional farming. That's going to be the prevalent model or one of the most viable models. We can say, oh, no, let's forget about animal farming. We'll do synthetic protein. There's a very interesting study about Rob, from Rob Burton from Ruralis about uh, uh, synthetic meat wars. And basically his argument is it could happen with meat, what happened with vanilla and with what happened with indigo, that it really, the natural version becomes kind of a niche market and the rest all becomes synthetic. Well, obviously that has major implications for producers and hence also for extension. We could go to a future where we uh, go very digital uh, with drones. Uh, uh, if you see the picture of the guy, yeah, there's a bit of light there sitting behind the screen that's kind of a interesting utopian dystopian vision of uh, John Deere about the future farmer. So the future farmer doesn't go in the field anymore and they just sit the whole day in a semi-dark room uh, behind the screen as if they were kind of in a, in a US war room. Huh? Like with their joystick manipulating the drones. It could also be uh, that, that the future or one of the futures is agroecological. Uh, and it also has its own set of values uh, that, that tends to reject a lot of technology, it, it tends to also be about retro innovation, going back to food forests, you know, very radically different from plowing and those kinds of things. Aquaponics, you know, combining fish with horticulture, uh, rooftop farming, urban development with, with farming. So uh, there's a big range of different futures. And that obviously also has implications for uh, how does extension connect to all those different futures. And so, so that's the question. What do futures of agriculture imply for our extension research agenda? And that's the goal also of my, my talk. So um, there are some questions which are related to understanding transformation and extension, uh, connecting to one of those key words, transformation. It's really important to do so because different countries have different ways they want to go forward. I just put here some policy documents. So for example, Chile now has Transforma Alimentos. And basically, it's quite interesting, they call it Transforma, but they stay in the same paradigm of exporting a lot of foods, wines, fruits, etc. You could say, how transformative is that? It has a clear value behind it, exporting, economic oriented, make sure that the farmers can cope with that model, so that has implications for how you organize extension. The Netherlands, eh? there are not a lot of Dutch people here, but those that are here can read it. Uh, this is the, the new policy document of the Ministry of Agriculture. It says agriculture, nature and food, uh, providing value and being connected, something like that. And this is the Netherlands as kind of a front runner in circular agriculture. So our Minister of Agriculture has said we need to go away from that kind of import nutrients, export food paradigm. We need to become much more circular and become more locally based, which is quite a rupture, quite a disruption with our old policy paradigm and obviously that has quite some implications for extension because you need to start reconnecting plant sectors <coughs> with animal sectors you need to connect with the energy sectors you need to connect with the urban areas so also advisors will need to support farmers making those new connections making new connections themselves <coughs> Canada digital agriculture uh, they have a different future um, and here France uh, France is thinking seriously about you know making agroecology part of formal policy, or maybe it already is. I know for sure it is already in Nicaragua. There the government has said our policy and our laws and our rules are for agroecology. So that all has implications for the extension systems you organize around it. So here's the first set of questions. Uh, understanding transformation and extension. I think some future questions uh, should be, for example, how do advisory systems respond to and connect to different transition pathways? Uh, do they declare a certain value or do they stay neutral? Uh, do you see clearly some subsystems emerging? And I'll also talk about that uh, in the next slide. Uh, but also, for example, how do what you could call grassroots advisory mo movements develop? Uh, if, if farmers have a new radical direction, how do they construct their their circle of advisors, how are these being trained, how are these being financed, how does that work, how do these become stronger, how do these gain a position, and we have limited insights in those, and it's quite interesting to, to look at that with all these new flavors coming up, but also how do they mani man manage value dilemmas, how do they manage economic growth and also 
growing kind of the quantity of food with sustainability, how do they manage it as a system, as an advisor? But I also find a particularly interesting question, and I think also people like Gianluca would like to look at those questions, it's just a guess. Uh, those are the politics of policy attention. Uh, so how does policy determine whether they support a certain flavor or another flavor? Uh, who determines that? What happens there in Brussels, in all those rooms at the, at the ministries? Uh, what are the lobby processes? And also, how does this translate in advisory systems? What is being funded, what is not being funded? Who is being included for advice, who is being excluded? Now, obviously, we have already looked at inclusion and exclusion questions, particularly with access uh, in terms of um, uh, the affordability of systems. But this is also an interesting question. And also, how are continuities and discontinuities managed in the advisory profession? With these new paradigms coming in, you know, how do advisors cope with it? How do they retool themselves? But also sometimes, how do they kind of ignore it and remain continuous? And they say, yeah, there's this new policy, but farmer, don't worry, we'll give you what you want. Yeah? It's interesting to look at those types of questions. So another term, and it's partly related to this, is about plur plur plurality or about diversity. When I put the word down, I thought maybe this is very Dunglish, so not real English, but I looked it up and it seems to have to do with, with different streams, so it's not that bad English. Um, well, we are already looking at this, and I think this is a really interesting stream. And so with some Norwegian colleagues, uh, we did some work on what we, could, what we called sub acres. So basically we saw that different groups of farmers really had their own system. So within a country, there were, were kind of separate systems for kind of really top and really kind of profit and productivity oriented farmers that even sourced it from uh, outside the country but there were also farmers basically doing a bit of hobbying just staying in production and they just said you know one regular visit from the state advisory year is sufficient for us and also there's now a really interesting project AgriLink who's looking at micro acres uh, so basically also looking at how how do farmers form their own advisory networks? What does it mean in terms of adoption of practices, etc.? And we also did some work in Chile where we looked at it through the lens of social capital. And there we saw that uh, different farmers with different resource endowments all have their own advisory networks, some with really diverse types of social capital, uh, being able to get all the types of knowledge they need, and some more restrained. But also sometimes they had intelligent solutions. They got to the top advisor through a colleague. So they didn't get the advice firsthand, but with a detour. And I think uh, getting to know this diversity is, is, is important. And we have started to do it, but I think we could do more in this area. So I have just some questions here, some, some topics. It's all suggestions. And so what we could look at is, for example, what I've coined advice consumption styles. So we have farming styles, but also how do farmers consume advice? What choices do they make? Why do they stick to an agribusiness advisor who comes anyway? Or how do they combine it with an independent one? Yeah, or maybe they go for a one-stop shop model. Yeah, in Africa, for example, there are lots of hub models, one-stop shop. Yeah, why do they go for that? Do they make strategic combinations? Does it also fluctuate over time in terms of implementation processes? Yeah, there's some work, but not a lot yet. I think that could be interesting. And also, how advisors switch between advisory styles. Uh, how do advisors deal with these different networks of farmers, these different clients? Uh, are they able to switch? Or does a company, for example, have a division in task? You go to that type of farmer, you go to that type of farmer. And uh, we already know, for example, work of Julie Ingram, uh, there's different styles of interaction. Uh, how do they combine that in their professional life? Uh, and can you train a farmer to or an advisor to work with different audiences, or should they stick to one type of audience, with one type of advice consumption style? Then a very interesting question, I think, is about the average and the rock star advisor. And uh, when I coined this term, I looked it up, I found this really nice slide about the rock star advisors from a different context. But, you know, why are certain advisors so popular? What builds their aura? What is it that they become like the top in their field? Why are they regarded highly by colleagues, by farmers? What is it? And how is reputation built? I think that's also an interesting question. Then what also is interesting in terms of plurality is about advisory synergies. Yeah, there's some work on networks of advisors. You could do more on that, but also on advisory bubbles. 
uh, talking about the post-truth the post society, uh, the Facebook bubbles. Uh, do farmers also have their bubbles? What does it imply for transformation? Uh, what does imply, that imply for that advisory profession? Does it kind of miss the ten tendencies in the world and does it become obsolete because it's not looking around? Uh, does it have kind of too close networks? Uh, it's interesting, I think, also to look at those types of questions. And then connecting to the work of Pierre, uh, of the back office, uh, the, the research, uh, the, the, the renewal of, of the knowledge, uh, the education, the training of advisors, how do these different networks have their own back offices? And we know relatively little about it. And then the last one on this slide, I think we also should do much more about age, experience, and gender composition of advisory organization, and how that relates to collegial and generational interaction. And we know that that, that, that gender matters in agriculture. Uh, we know that diversity is good for organizations in general, but we don't know how that plays out in our extension organizations. I know there's some work also at this conference on gender and advisors, etc. but I think that could be done way more, and I think also we could look way more at how is knowledge transferred from one generation of advisors, but also how do younger advisors, digital natives, influence the older generations? And so how does that work at a firm level? I think that's an interesting set of questions. Well, another term, disruption, disruption and extension. So we have all kinds of you know, tendencies coming towards agriculture, digitalization, digital farming, drones, internet of things. Uh, we have um, precision farming, we have data collection everywhere. Uh, it's a big, potentially disruptive factor. We have uh, well, the circularity models, uh, also a connection with different industries. We have what I call synthetization, uh, uh, synthetic meat, synthetic fish, synthetic uh, uh, protein, synthetic everything. Uh, a lot of things are pro uh, possible. Uh, you can also manipulate algae, etc. What does that mean for our food crops, for the way we produce? <coughs> Uh, urbanization, uh, urban farming, urbanization of the planet, will it become much more important? And uh, maybe we will see that greenhouse areas, uh, Almeria, uh, at Westland in the Netherlands will disappear because everything is going to be on rooftops, who knows? But also the financialization and the corporatization. Uh, investment of big companies, uh, big land owners, also shifting from farmer uh, owned operated farms to managed farms big numbers of workers. Uh, we, we, we tend to focus an extension on the farmer as an owner operator, uh, but we don't engage a lot with those big corporate farms. So that also raises new questions. So for example, in this area of digitalization, just an example, you already see emerging work on what you could call digital ACUS. Uh, so you see work at what you could call a macro system levels. People have already coined the digital agricultural innovation systems, or also talking about digiware. Uh, people have looked at precision agriculture innovation system, how that develops. We had the project Smart ACIS. And so people are already looking at, you know, what is the new ACIS, but then digital. We have at the meso level emerging work on farmer advisor interaction. For example, Callum Eastwood in a forthcoming special issue really looked at how you know, advisors sit with farmers to interpret models and tools and data. That's a new role of advisors. It's also about kind of the analog knowledge versus the digital knowledge. Uh, I also had a recent graduate student who looked at farmers and they basically said, yeah, we, we really like this digital farming, but we still go out there to check everything because we don't believe in the data. Maybe in five years time we will believe in the data. So this is also really interesting. How does that interact? So there's upcoming work, also about social media, social media networks, advisors on social media, apps, you know, also how do farmers select apps, what apps are good, what are the limitations of apps. We have relatively little critical studies on apps. It's quite interesting that there's now a whole sea of apps and there's now apps to select other apps. Yeah, so farmers are also reacting to that. Yeah, and those are interesting phenomena. And also at the micro level, and we can look at cyber physical social systems. So we have cyber systems, uh, digital systems, we have physical or ecological systems, the farm, farm infrastructure, but we also have the social system. How does that interact? And it has been coined by Liutas for this upcoming special issue, but also in the upcoming project, the Zira with Gianluca, we also have the 
cyber physical social systems. Yeah. Still a lot of work to be done there. But also yeah, uh, apps for digital citizen and data science. And so also how because do citizens become a knowledge generator? How does that also interact with farmer knowledge and monitoring agricultural biodiversity, for example? But also farmers monitoring their own value chain with their mobile phones. What does that mean? What type of data does it generate? Do advisors need to play a role in that? That raises all kinds of questions. Yeah, but also, you know, <coughs> advisory services on public relations with the, with, with the general public. Uh, also, social media. Do we need professional social media advisors for farmers? Uh, I had a, a student, a master's student, who did research on how do farmers manage Facebook accounts and Twitter accounts to create a better image for the sector. Well, is that also an area for advisors? Uh, that you have uh, a Kim Kardashian type person uh, who's really good on social media advising farmers. So, um, uh, there are questions related to this, uh, such as how do these extension providers adjust? Uh, will there be new <coughs> business models for the existing uh, extension providers? Or do they miss the boat, as we say in the Netherlands? Uh, they, the boat goes away uh, with all kinds of new possibilities. They miss it and they stay and they die, basically, in terms of their business. Uh, we see also all kinds of new startups coming up, and we don't have a good insight on those. So I, I put some names here. So. That is Lee, Livestock Precision Farming, Livestock Robotics, Smart Farming, Agrimetics. They're all uh, dedicated startups providing new services. Will they make uh, the old ones obsolete? Uh, and you see this in digital, but you also see initiatives, for example, for care farming. Uh, the Steunpunt, Steunpunt Groene Zorg in Belgium, like Care Point uh, or, or kind of Support Point Green Care. And also, do we see new advisory alliances? And for cross-sectoral systems, emerging issues. Uh, with cross-sectoral, I mean, for example, circular farming, energy, fiber, food, urban, integrated. Do we see new people coming in? Architectural advisors connecting with farm advisors. How does that work? Do they understand each other? We don't know. I think we should investigate. But also new alliances. For example, we have this joint data, which is a multi-stakeholder cooperative, to see how can we work with all that data and how do we do it fairly uh, and also recognize the owners of the data. Those are new uh, constructs. We need to understand them. But also more on the interactional level, uh, the interaction, like I said, data farmer advisor. Uh, the rise of what I call the augmented advisor. And you already there above see uh, a guy looking, or a lady, uh, to uh, uh, a tablet and getting all kinds of additional information on the tomato. Uh, so do we get digitally enhanced advisors? Uh, we know there's already virtual advisors, for example, in Second Life, uh, there's games. Uh, but, you know, do we see kind of a cyborg type advisory emerging? Uh? Also, you know, virtual advisory accounts, uh, uh, long distance, you know, all calling in. What does that mean for the quality of interaction? Those are all new questions. And then, obviously, also from a method perspective, there's an interesting question on how do we use all that data? Uh, data science on extension. Uh, will we be able to predict learning, to predict uh, also interaction patterns, multi-stakeholder uh, networks through the data that's being generated? A uh, very interesting way to go into. And then also, potentially, we could get interesting question on power and concentration. Uh, we all know Uber, we know Airbnb, platform technologies, connecting demand and supply. Basically, you know, making other companies obsolete. Uh, will we get these in agriculture? What does that mean? Uh, will they make life of advisors more difficult? Uh, because if you talk to Uber taxi drivers, uh, some are really happy, but most say it's really hard to make a living. Will such things also start happening in agriculture? Or when Amazon moves in, uh, what, what could happen? I think we need to really keep that uh, in, in our uh, kind of perspective. Okay, we're almost there, no worries. Yeah. It's, a, it's, it's a long one, I know. Probably more than 40 minutes. <laughs> Sorry for that. So then, um, a little bit on the human organizational side of transformation and disruption and extension. So, all these phenomena, they have uh, an impact on the farmer and also on farm workers. And so financialization, scale increase, disruptive technology, migrant labor, multifunctionality, uh, they raise 
questions from a human perspective. And I also saw this, for example, one presentation on farmer stress and advisors. I think those are really interesting topics. And so I think we should do much more work on how does extension deal with finance? How does it deal with worker management, with succession planning? Uh, uh, I think we still have too much focus more on the technical topics. We should more look at those managerial, organizational issues. And so, for example, we did some work on financial advice. Quite interesting also to see banks, how they come in. Also these mandatory relationships. If you want a loan, you must take this advice. <coughs> interesting dynamics. Um, we had a real nice review. Uh, Ruth Nettle was also involved on uh, advice and advisory roles about work on farms. I think we can do much more work on that. The workers, uh, their role in innovation, are they being supported? How do they work with advisors? Uh, what is their, 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 um, their, their kind of mandate of operation on the farm? Uh, um, quite interesting to know. And obviously also uh, the human side, joy of farming, stress, mental health issues. I think in the Netherlands we have now some dedicated stress consultants for farmers. But we don't know a lot about that field of work. We don't know how they're being trained, where they come from. Do they have a health background? Are they kind of uh, people who just have an interest for that? I haven't seen a lot of work on that. Uh, so also, what does this mean for the professional profile? Well, together also with all these you know, disruptive changes, transformations, they have a very global nature. Uh, Gianluca already referred to globalization. And uh, obviously this has also implications for extension. And uh, I think that the topic of internationalization of extension, it is something we have looked at to some extent. We have also looked at why some models work in some countries and why not. Uh, also we looked at the, the training and visit. There was also a global model, why did it resonate with certain contexts. But I think we need to do more work on that. And so we need to, we need to look at, you know, is there some kind of a global flow of extension models versus context specificity? Is there a particular kind of what Jan Dauer van der Ploeg, a rural sociology, called the art de la localité, art de la localité. I need to take some French classes from Pierre. <laughs> huh? <laughs> Thank you very much. So the local art of extension. Uh, uh, we now do some work in Ethiopia. <coughs> and we're, we're talking there about innovation platform, multi-historical approaches. They fail each and every and every and every time should we continue to do that? Is there no other way to realize some of those objectives through a more locally specific form? And so I think that's an interesting question. This is particularly relevant because we now see a lot of companies operating internationally. And so we have the Dutch company, the Frisian, and they basically go to Kenya and say, we help you build up your dairy sector. We have Delphi, they work in multiple countries. How does that knowledge travel? And how do these people deal with intercultural issues, etc.? We don't know a lot about that. And then also, uh, this is more farmer learning oriented, the global social media networks. Farmers exchange a lot on social media. A uh, New Zealand farmer with a food problem of a cow, uh, it might be an Irish farmer giving an answer, but does that work? Uh, does that also you know, enhance global f flow of products uh, that they start demanding a certain you know, ointment, which is, used to be Irish and then it goes to New Zealand? and then it eradicates the kiwi because it's a biohazard, who knows? Yeah. So there are lots of questions. Eh? How do formal eh, professional advisors, informal farmer advisors operate cross-culturally? What adaptation dynamics take place or do not take place, both in terms of the technologies, but also the methodologies? And I think those are still interesting questions. Then, the eco-material side of extension. Eh? Next week I'm going to the Rural Sociology Conference. I realize this type of terminology would fit better there. But um, these different farming styles and these transition pathways, they have different material contexts. Digital context is different from an agroecology context. Mm -hmm. uh, farming has always been material. You have uh, artifacts, you have the soil, you have the animals. These you know, new technologies create new ways of engaging of farmers with that material context. But also, how does the advisor work with that? How do they use it to enhance their advice? I know that, for example, in AgriDemo, people are working on that kind of uh, olfactory, textual uh, notions of advice and learning. And I think uh, that would merit more work. But also, uh, how would this happen in kind of hybrid material context when the agriculture meets the digital? And so, 
I think, you know, questions should be like, how do farmers and farmers engage with this? How does it affect their encounters? But also, what does this imply for how their tools are being made and being designed? Uh, maybe a farmer likes to, you know, have a very visual tool, and an advisor wants to have a really numerical tool. How can you make it work for both audiences? Uh, but also, how can you train advisors to become sensitive to this? And so, there's all kinds of future questions, uh, and you can also see it on the picture. Uh, the computer is also a new material form, and they both look at the screen, they interpret it. We need to know more about those types of interactions. So obviously this also needs to be uh, um, entered in the education and training of farmers. Uh, like I already said, the digital native advisory services, what does it imply for the next generation? What about advisory ethics in view of diversity, power dynamics? Uh, should you speak up more? Should you become more activistic as an advisor or stay neutral when you find that you don't get enough attention for your type of system? Um, and also, how is this being done in training at universities, at technical schools? Is there, is there attention for it? Or do we still train them all to be really like soil focused or do they become more transdisciplinary? And yeah, there's all kinds of initiatives like the Swedish initiative, they reflect on that. We used to have AgriSpin with cross visits. I think also a really good way of getting that learning going. In the UK we have land bridge, and so it would be interesting also to study this more. Well then, and now I'm really almost at the end, the global comparison. So we used to have, until the late 90s, quite some interesting books on global comparison. Now we do have some articles, but we don't have those types of big international comparisons anymore. I wouldn't know how to get money for it, but it would be really interesting if we would try to get that going again. Yeah? Um, also to see how does the pace, timing differ across contexts. So what similarities, difference can we see on how changes unfold? What are the underlying determinants? Uh, do we see new grand models emerging within diversity? Yeah? We used to have T and V, we used to have demand driven was a very big you know, term. Do we have a new one? Yeah? Augmented advisory, virtual advisory, eco-material advisory, I don't know. Eh? It would be interesting to see if that would be appropriate while still recognizing the diversity. Eh? So I think the most recent book which has a more global comparison is this knowledge-driven development which is about agribusiness type uh, extension models, but else than that, I haven't seen much. So which theories can help us? So extension science has always been pluralist in terms of theories. We have drawn on psychology, sociology, economics, adult learning, all kinds of theories. And we could expand the toolbox. And we could look more at practice theories, really looking at everyday practices, the engagements. That's the developed field of theory. We could look at organization studies, for example, the concept of organizational identity. We are working with it, divided in intangible identity, values, tangible identity, services, you know, different drivers of change that could be a really interesting concept to look at these change dynamics. For the material aspect, we could look at ANT, actor network theory, which takes into account the agency of the material, the actants. Uh, we could also look for those people who are really about fluidity and assemblage. Uh, mind, not really easy stuff, but uh, you could do interesting stuff with it. You could look at science and technology studies who have worked with the concept of innovation cultures. Uh, so that innovation is not globally uniform. We should look much more at what is the local innovation culture. We could look at economics and management. For example, how do digital business models emerge? Uh, there's a whole field now on digital business model, not in agriculture, but I think it would be relevant to us. And I think it could also be relevant to look at social networks and uh, looking at advisory networks, farmer networks, uh, human material networks. It, it offers a good possibility to visualize also where is the power concentrated in networks. So that also could be a really interesting way to go. So there's lots of theories, not just these, but these are some ideas. And then uh, I couldn't, you know, end this, this talk without this. Otherwise I would get Michael Kugler on my back for the rest of the conference. And it is indeed very important. Yeah. Uh, I do see ESE as a very important scientific network, and I also think science should remain important here. That doesn't uh, exclude that we also should exchange a lot with advisors, 
uh, with educators. But does this like stuff have any practical and policy relevance? Well, some of it might be a bit fluffy and a bit abstract, but sometimes it's also needed to get later on to more concrete knowledge, more concrete models. And I think looking at these types of issues could inform adjustments in advisor training, both initial but also continuous on-the-job training. It could support advisory organizations to make sense of change dynamics. I remember at some point that I had a, uh, a visit of some Norwegians and uh, Harden Brinks from Delphi, a big uh, Dutch advisory company was there and he's saying, yeah, we're doing drone services, we're doing this, but we have no clue how to do it. We have no clue what to make of this new digital world. And so it can help those organizations make sense of it. It can highlight inclusion, exclusion effects, who is wanted in policies, who is excluded, and hence also help counter power imbalances, which can say, well, uh, you find these values important, but you're actually neglecting this advisory system. You're not giving them access to subsidies. You're not training them sufficiently. It can help shed a light on diversity and power. And, and hence, it can help for uh, policy targeting. And then the last one, which I, I, I added this morning, where to publish all this great new work, uh, also doing some promotion because I'm now one of the editors-in-chief of uh, JEE. Uh, yesterday we got the news that the journal has an impact factor, uh, that's only important for academics, others don't care about it. Uh, um, so. Uh, it becomes more attractive to publish there because you get more credits for it, <laughs> if any. So, um, you know, we're very happy to welcome all that great new work, also great new work coming from this, uh, this conference. So please do submit. And this was it. Thanks for hanging in despite the high temperatures. I'm also sweating like crazy, like a horse. And uh, have a really great and uh, rewarding uh, exchange during these days. So thank you very much.